I will try to take it in English because we have here Professor Davor Chalto, if I pronounce it correct. And uh, actually, he, he will be lecturing us today on the early church. He's going to explain everything about, uh, about this topic. But if I'm gonna introduce myself, my name is Father Joseph Bogran, or Yusuf Bogran, as you pronounce it in Arabic. Um, and uh, I will be coordinator in this course, working with Professor Davor. Uh, all times we will meet here in Vienna. And I will be also administrating like the outline of the course uh, via the platform that we will have some instructions about it. I will leave the stage for Davor to introduce himself and then go forth with the material we are going to study today. Thank you. Thanks. Hello and good start. Leider kann ich nicht alles auf Deutsch präsentieren. Damals könnte ich Deutsch ganz gut sprechen, aber leider nicht mehr. Es braucht viel Zeit, wenn ich auf Deutsch spreche, nachzudenken, was ich sagen will und wie. Deswegen werde ich auch für Englisch sprechen, aber dann später natürlich können wir auf Deutsch diskutieren. So, the first lecture uh, within this uh, cycle of three lectures uh, on early Christianity will deal primarily with the context of early Christianity and uh, the early developments surrounding the main protagonists and main texts that uh, both early Christians used and that we use now in order to learn about uh, early Christianity and early church and also we'll uh, be talking about some of the main figures of the early uh, early Christian theology. Uh, after that, over these uh, the remaining two days, we'll be also looking at early Christian places of worship because that is another very material component to the whole story about early Christianity and also how various ancient philosophical ideas, Greek and Roman, uh, influenced early Christian understanding of their own faith and world and also how they responded to, to that. Uh, so there'll be a lot of these different layers, different segments and I will try not to uh, talk all the time but rather to spare uh, more time for your questions and discussions because that is usually more beneficial way than just one way uh, story. Uh, and you can always stop me at any point uh, if you have some questions or comments. So uh, the first topic that I wanted us to focus on is the social, historical and cultural context of early Christianity. And I would like to start us with this simple question, what do we know about a context in which Christianity Appeared. So this is not a rhetorical question, but actually a question for you to, to, to you know, give some, some kind of feedback. What, what do you know based on you know, your previous education, your interest, your readings of history and, and Christianity about the context, society, culture, ideas that were dominant, the context in which Christianity and the early church no, we basically know that it started with the Pentecost, so when um, the twelve disciples started to go out into the world and share Christ with the whole world, mm -hmm. and that it, when when talking about the society, we know that um, it was a way that the Gentiles didn't like, because mm -hmm. um, it was a way that um, taught to like it, it simply taught other ways than they were used to to live by. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there was a lot of um, what, what <laughs> persecution, persecution, mm -hmm. <laughs> persecution um, connected to mm -hmm. um, the upcoming or um, of this new way, as they call it. Mm -hmm. That's true. But not only of the Gentiles, I think in the beginning even more of the Jews, because um, they didn't like Jesus and they didn't like his disciples, mm -hmm. so 
um, they persecuted the church from its very beginning. When we look at um, Paul, for example, he was one of the persecutors of the church who was ready to travel in order to persecute Christians. Mm -hmm. So this was the social standing of the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Culturally, we also know that um, what, we have this in, in Acts where, where um, they're afraid that Art Artemis, I think, um, those who made the stamps for her mm -hmm. were afraid that they were, were going to be jobless mm -hmm. because of this new way. Mm -hmm. So um, they really saw it as a danger in many ways. Mm -hmm. Anything else? What, what was the state uh, within which Christianity appeared? What the state was called uh, or which early Christians were inhabited citizens? What do you mean by state? State. Uh, Stop. Oh, so, so, hmm? Zustand. Zustand? No, 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 Zustand. Zustand. Like, Zustand. Like, yeah, like okay. where, right? Yeah. Yeah. What? Were they were first called? So, okay. So, we have that as a, as a general political context in which Christianity appeared. Uh, Rome and Roman Empire. Uh, what do we know about the Roman Empire? This first part, since it's just a background, I think it's better if we discuss it a little bit before before I continue talking more. Well, Caesar was like God for them. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, um, the Roman Empire, there were Gentiles, most of them, or all of them. Um, they were almost conquering the whole world. Mm -hmm. They have built out a lot of roads mm -hmm. and which made it easier for the Christianity to spread around the world, which, um, which um, shows that the time for Jesus to come was perfect in that mm -hmm. area at that time. Um, also, they were strong in power and politics. They, held, uh, they had um, a lot of um, not, um, 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 influence mm -hmm. around the world and they were trying to control the whole world with one like one whole world, world religion mm -hmm. and made it much uh, harder for the the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I think what really helped them too was the language because um, like if you want to be superior to someone you just uh, make them speak your language because then you have them under your control. Mm -hmm. Very well. So, the Roman Empire was uh, one of the dominant empires, and especially when it comes to the later history of the Mediterranean and the rest of the world, we can safely say it was the empire uh, of, of its time. And it is uh, not possible, I think, to overstate uh, the importance of Roman Empire for the later development of Christianity. Because many of those ideas that we later encounter uh, from the very early period, and of course, later church fathers and uh, uh, political figures in the history of Christianity, they all, this way or the other, reacted uh, against the background of the Roman Empire in which, in which they lived. Because as we know, Roman Empire continued to exist for a very long time, even after uh, the beginning sort of Christianity after after Christ. So in a, in many ways, Christianity that was formed, at least uh, the main branches of Christianity, uh, were actually Roman, various uh, in various ways Roman Christianity uh, that that appeared. That doesn't, of course, mean that they were all happy uh, being. Uh, uh, Within that living within that state, or they all loved that state, not at all. Some of them did, some of them didn't, uh, because all these periods uh, uh, changed uh, over the course of the first uh, first couple of centuries, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Uh, but that was the background against which they uh, were formulating their own ideas about the world and also uh, politics. And this map shows you 
the empire under the emperor uh, Augustus. So this was the time when Jesus appeared, was born, and was uh, after, immediately after uh, the time of Augustus was also uh, crucified. And this is the context in which the early church started to exist. Uh, Rome, just to give you a couple of information, of course, the, that topic in itself is uh, enormous, but Rome was a very advanced, uh, advanced society and state, even judged by later standards. In addition to the infrastructure that we already heard something about, they were also a multicultural empire, which means that different languages were spoken there, different people lived in various uh, parts of the empire, and it was also a very, for most of the time, a very tolerant state when it comes to various religious practices. Uh, Romans generally uh, didn't force anyone to follow one certain way of practicing religion or even believing. That's an important thing. Uh, a major change started to occur just before the time of Christianity with Julius Caesar and then Augustus when they started, maybe for the first time in their history, I'm not sure, to worship also human beings as gods. They didn't like doing that in the previous period, in the period that we call uh, the period of the Republic. Uh, actually, they uh, were so scandalized and afraid that human beings can be worshipped as gods because they probably were afraid that through that practice too much of religious and political power would be focused uh, in the hands of certain people or certain families. So they tried to do everything to kind of disperse uh, power, both uh, political and religious, of course, among influential aristocratic families, but not monopolized by one person or just one clan. Uh, one thing that, they, that the Romans didn't like when it comes to their uh, religious system are those practices that were focused on something that was let me put it that way, hidden from the public gaze. Roman religion was fundamentally social and political. Uh, in ancient Roman times, unlike in our modern times, there was no distinction between, strictly speaking, religious sphere and, let's say, social and political sphere. Nowadays, when we live in the West, we, it's so natural for us to talk about religion as something that you, you do uh, by yourself, something that you believe in, certain rituals that you conduct. In ancient Rome it wasn't like that. Being Roman meant that you were religious. How you practice certain religious, what kind of cults you followed, that was a different matter. Uh, they tried to integrate as many cults as possible because that way they were also spreading their influence and stabilizing uh, their state. But what it didn't like were those activities where certain group of people would isolate themselves and conduct religious practices, uh, so to say, in a closed environment, away from the public gaze, because they were afraid always that they might be conspiring something against the state. And they didn't like that. So you may say that, that their treatment of religion was from the very beginning along the lines of what we nowadays call ideology. Religion was ideology because it, it was contributing to the stability and the well-being of the state and ultimately uh, the purpose of Roman religion was to contribute to the stability and prosperity of the city of Rome and the Roman state. So all those activities that somehow were not oversee or controlled even indirectly by the state, Romans perceived as potentially subversive. That was the reason why they didn't like uh, many of those so-called mystery cults, including, for example, uh, Dionysian or Bacchic mysteries, especially in certain periods of times, 
And one can claim that also the reason why, uh, at least part of that big question, why uh, there were so many tensions between the early Christian community and Roman authorities was that they might have perceived Christianity as one of those cults. Uh, and we'll see later from their administrations how they perceived early Christians and the church. Uh, one of those very popular cults as well was the last one listed here, uh, the cult of God Mithras and Mithraism. And uh, I won't go into details, we don't have time here, but just tell you a couple of things related to this uh, very popular, extremely popular cult toward the uh, later uh, part of uh, the empire. Of period of the empire, uh, Mithras was a god who was born uh, from a ray of light, uh, and the place of worship was a cave. So, followers of the cult were worshiping by getting together and uh, having a sacrificial, uh, offering sacrifices and having a common meal. There is blood involved in the cult as a way of purification. So you can see structurally just one of these cults. If you go to Bacchic Mysteries, uh, you will find more uh, of those parallels. You will find ideas that followers of that cult drink wine, followers of the cult of Bacchus drink wine, and also for them, we are not sure uh, whether that was symbolically or real, uh, wine was meant to be blood of God that provides immortality. So if you just uh, consider these two cults and the ideas that surrounding them, you can see how from the perspective of a Roman citizens, Christianity could easily fit the pattern and be considered as one of those many cults that were there, some of them potentially problematic and disturbing others when they become more massive and more open, which eventually happened with Mithraism, uh, could be tolerated. So, another factor, another uh, element to this context in which early Christianity appeared was Judaism, of course. Uh, what do we know about Judaism? that they are the chosen people of God. Yes, so that's one of the very fundamental things that uh, the Old Testament, what Christians call the Old Testament, tells a story of this chosen people, uh, the followers of God, who basically uh, made a deal, a testament or a contract uh, with uh, uh, God. You'll be my people, I'll be your God, I'll uh, take care of you and you follow uh, the commandments and you stay faithful to me. Uh, how that happened and all the complicated history you'll be learning in other courses, that's not our job to discuss it here, but Judaism is uh, another context in which Christianity found itself. Uh, do you know what was the status of the Jews and that area in which Christianity appeared within the Roman Empire. Well, first of all, the Jews, the Jews thought that, or they, or they knew, or they thought that the Roman Empire is are the ones who, the ones who, you know, who um, have the power or the, over them, or they trying to control them, and they liked it, and they thought that the Messiah, Jesus, or whoever, or the Messiah who will come and free them from this kind of slavery, let's say slavery. And so they hated them, and, and also they, that's why they rejected Jesus when he was um, inviting also the, the, the uh, yes. Gentiles yeah. to Christianity. Yeah. And for them, the Gentiles were, I'm sorry, dogs. That's why they hated them and they thought they are lower classes. Or yeah, and that was, by the way, uh, just to clarify, that was not exclusively uh, the property or the point of view that characterized them. Uh, in the antiquity, you very often find similar the Greeks, uh, the Hellens basically consider all the barbarians something of a kind of a lesser kind of human beings. Uh, slaves were also not considered uh, human beings in, 
full sense. So, uh, in other words, uh, there was a lot of that uh, going on uh, around this time or a little bit earlier and, and after. Judaism is uh, important for us here because uh, in this time, when the Roman Empire established itself over the Middle East, uh, Jewish people reacted differently to that because uh, there were those who wanted, of course, to be closer to the authorities there, the dominant of the dominant empire, and there were those who didn't like this proximity and perceived Roman Empire as basically um, uh, an occupying power that's taking away their customs and their freedom. Uh, that's why there were many of those movements, uh, liberation movements, you could call them, uh, in this time, and a lot of also prophets who were presenting themselves as prophets or people expected them to be prophets uh, who uh, were expected to lead people uh, toward the path of liberation against the Roman Empire. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, this territory, the territory of Palestine, and the Jews there had autonomy within the Roman Empire because it became clear that the Roman Empire just couldn't force them to accept completely their customs. So they allowed them to keep the temple, to keep uh, offering sacrifices their way, uh, but they had administrative control over the territory uh, to make sure that nothing that would actually endanger the interests of Rome and Roman state uh, could actually go on. Uh, already these two things that we now explained tell you how complicated the situation was when Christianity appeared there. Uh, we know that Christianity appeared as a Jewish sect, as a sect within Judaism. All the first Christians were Jews. Uh, they found themselves in a context where already the Roman Empire looked with suspicion upon uh, the whole Jewish thing there, all these different movements. Then there is a cult that anyway has kind of many resemblances to other cults and Romans were already allergic to, to some of them. And then there is a more, even more complicated situation over the next couple of decades when there is a war and then there is against the Jews and then there is finally uh, uh, revocation of even that autonomy and disappearance of, of an organized uh, uh, administrative uh, rule in Jewish rule in that region. Uh, just uh, two, two things related to, to uh, uh, Judaism. We know that, we all know the Old Testament, the Old Testament books. The Old Testament, of course, is a Christian uh, name for all those things that come before Christianity and Christian books, but are relevant for what happens in the Christian New Testament, New Era. But, of course, in Judaism, uh, you wouldn't call it Old Testament. Uh, you would call it Tanakh, uh, based on those three main parts of uh, the Jewish scripture. Uh, the Torah, or the, books of wisdom, uh, the five books of Moses, uh, then the prophets, and books of wisdom or ketuvim. Is it ketuvim or ketupim? I know it. I know it. I know it. It's ketupim with the v, not the v. Uh, the v. That's uh, that's that's the old tricky part of v, veta, and beta. Mm -hmm. Veta and beta. Yeah. So you can see. Yeah. We have different pronunciations, and we have a temple, and. The temple is again very important for us here, not only because it's mentioned in the New Testament as well, and actually mentioned a couple of times, but also because some Christian theologians actually claim that it is precisely the temple theology, the temple service, what shaped the mind and worldview and faith of the early Christians. So both the temple as the actual place of worship and the heart 
of the ancient Jewish religion and the scripture, which talked about uh, the beginning of the world, but also about uh, that Messiah that was about to come, would become foundational for early Christianity. And we are still now talking this about this period of uh, after the renovation of the temple in which Christianity appeared. So it's the so-called Second Temple period, after extensive uh, restorations of the Second Temple. And that period would come to an end uh, in 70 AD, during the war that I mentioned before, when uh, Rome destroyed the Temple and Jerusalem. Um, and the only thing that remained from the, the whole uh, area is one wall that is uh, still present in Jerusalem, which is not the wall of the actual temple, but rather of the supporting structure. So it was so thoroughly destroyed that nobody knows even now where, where was the actual location of the temple. We know it's a temple mountain, but where on the temple mountain? Nobody, nobody knows. And this is one uh, reconstruction of that temple. Uh, remember this image because when we discuss tomorrow uh, and uh, the day after about Christian architecture, the temple uh, will be quite important. The structure of the temple and these kind of different rooms that have various symbolic meanings. And the third element of this, uh, uh, of the context in which Christianity appeared, has to do with Greek culture. Why Greek culture? Because in the Mediterranean, especially eastern part of the Mediterranean, prior to the arrival, the rise of Rome, the dominant force, the dominant empire, uh, was Greek, Greek, basically Greek city-states with their colonies. They occupied and dominated most of the eastern Mediterranean and also some parts of uh, what we would call now West, like southern Italy, uh, also some provinces uh, in uh, Spain. So this was the context that ancient Rome inherited and the Christians found themselves there in this eastern part, which also means that Judaism in that part was Hellenized. Uh, most Jews uh, who lived and worked in diaspora actually used Greek as their first language. Uh, Christian scripture was for the first time record recorded in total, the version that, that survived in Greek, not in Aramaic, not in, not in Hebrew. Uh, and also Greek philosophy that so much influenced Roman philosophy would become decisive for conceptualizing many things within uh, Christian theology. Uh, it would virtually uh, be very difficult to imagine uh, this kind of Christian theology that we have without actually certain concepts uh, taken from Greek philosophy and Greek philosophical tradition. Which doesn't mean, of course, that uh, Christian theologians simply borrow things from Greek philosophy. Some of them actually uh, reacted against Greek philosophy. Uh, but there was a dialogue, and based on that dialogue, many of these uh, concepts uh, were clarified and became standard in Christian theology. And this is a map that uh, shows you the empire of uh, Alexander the Great, which is the beginning of what we call a uh, Hellenistic period, when actually Greek culture uh, became dominant in this Eastern uh, Mediterranean and Middle Eastern region and that of course would continue up until uh, the Roman conquest of these territories. So this is uh, uh, very briefly in very short lines the context in which Christianity appeared. Now we can ask another question that seems obvious, but when we start thinking about it, we'll discover that it's a little bit more complex. And that is the question of when did Christianity begin? So we now basically said where. It's Judea, it's the Middle Eastern region, within the Roman Empire, with the component, strong component of uh, Greek 
culture, Greek philosophy, Greek language, uh, Jewish heritage, uh, Jewish tradition, belief system, and of course Roman rule uh, and Roman political ideas. When did Christianity begin? First century. <laughs> How do we know that? How do we know that? And by the way, century is a pretty long period of time. So, uh, and especially first century AD was a very long <coughs> period of time because so many things happened there that actually, and we are fortunately uh, able to reconstruct most of those decades so that we can actually follow that century decade after decade and see how things were emerging and disappearing and changing over that period. But uh, let's first see why first century, why not second century or third century. Or I think it all started with um, the Holy Ghost, the ghost coming up uh, on the disciples in form of uh, fine tongues, you know, maybe uh, on the day of the Pentecost day. And, and then there they start, you know, um, dividing up themselves up in groups and mm -hmm. going to spread the gospel mm -hmm. in the whole world. I would, I would consider this as the beginning of Christianity. Mm -hmm. They were not called uh, Christians yet. Later then, they were called Christians, but I would say maybe that's the name of Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Yeah, I think if we see it maybe from a psychological point of view, um, I would say it began before Christ ascended, because when he taught, he already taught um, things, and he said to them, you have heard that, um, this and that, but I tell you, and he came to complete like the Jewish way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think this is already where he kind of started this new way. Mm -hmm. But maybe this is pretty mm -hmm. far away from what you mean. No, <laughs> oh, well, it's, uh, it's actually a, a kind of a, a really question that uh, there, there is no simple way uh, to answer it, and it pretty much depends on who you ask. Uh, both in terms of different scholars, but also in terms of, uh, you know, do you ask uh, Christians of a certain kind? Uh, would you, what, it's very difficult to imagine, for example, what would be the answer if you asked uh, the first generation of Christians, or does even the second generation of Christians. Some of them you can see from some of the documents that remain, and we'll go through the most important documents in a minute, you can see that there was a perception of something, we are a distinct group somehow. Uh, who belongs to that group is a different matter. And uh, there wouldn't be agreement on that for a very long time. Uh, others would probably say, well, we are just uh, the practicing Jews who follow their tradition and follow it uh, just much more strictly uh, and uh, much more honestly than actually the rest of the Jews. So in a certain, and that, that gave rise to the concept that you find sometimes in, in literature uh, called a Jewish Christianity, uh, to differentiate it from the later period when Christians were very clear about we are not Jews, uh, and Judaism and all of that is not something that belongs to us, to this period when actually it was a Jewish sect that practiced things differently, uh, thought about certain religious ideas differently than the rest of the uh, communities within Judaism. Uh, because let's not forget, Judaism at that time also wasn't a unified whole. There were many different uh, streams within Judaism uh, sects, if you want to call it that way, just as, you know, based on the etymology of the word. And Christianity appeared as one of them. Uh, the fact that then it turned a different uh, direction and, and, and followed a different path is, is something that belongs to history that, that we, we are going to talk about. So you can start with uh, simply uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ, and then define Christian movement as something that begins with uh, uh, this person and that is more or less how people understand various movements even in philosophy and that's why many of those authors over the course of the second and third centuries and fourth centuries 
thought of Christianity as a specific philosophy that has its main protagonist, the founder, just as I don't know Platonism had Plato uh, as its uh, main figure, and then a school that comes together around this main figure and then develops a tradition. That's one way of approaching it. Some scholars would say, no, 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 it was actually Paul that all of this story uh, was very uh, unstructured, with very many different uh, incoherent ideas, and all of that probably would have disappeared had it not been for Paul to actually contextualize Christian message in such a way that it appealed to people outside the Jewish context. And that is another thing to think about. Uh, we know already from uh, the New Testament that there was a tension between the Jewish part of Christian uh, movement and the Gentile part of Christian movement. Some uh, thought that everyone who comes uh, to us, the follow followers of Jesus, should actually convert to Judaism because this is, from their perspective, true Judaism, continuation of true Judaism. Others said, no, 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 Gentiles who are coming, they shouldn't, they shouldn't uh, follow the same uh, rules and circumcision and stuff like that uh, in order to become followers of Jesus. And the, the one who championed this, the second position was Paul. Uh, in addition to that, he was by far the most if we follow the traditional understanding of these early Christian writings, the most, most prolific of the early uh, followers of Jesus. He wrote most of those letters, epistles, to various churches, and he was the one who was contextualizing Christian goal vis-a-vis -vis both ancient Rome and Greek culture. So he that's the reason why many perceive Paul actually as this crucial figure that we are dealing in the later period with Pauline Christianity, not necessarily Jesus' Christianity, which is something to think about from a scholarly perspective, which of course is not something that you necessarily uh, want to think about from a priestly perspective, right? Uh, then some would say, well, actually, it is the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem that marks the turning point. That prior to that, uh, you would have these disagreements and disputes and ideas. Uh, are we Jewish? Is it another Jewish sect? Is it something else? And so on. But that this confrontation with Rome and this war, Jewish war, that uh, broke up and led to the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple, uh, was a turning point when it became impossible for this group to continue identifying itself, at <coughs> least for the majority, uh, most of the time, with uh, this particular tradition and sought ways to contextualize themselves vis-a-vis -vis Roman Empire that would, be, uh, that would present their cause differently from the Jewish question, which is a, strictly speaking political and social context. Uh, let, let us not forget that whenever we talk about certain ideas, even religious ideas, when we try to express our faith, that always happens within a certain historical, social and political context. We are not immune to that for a simple reason that we use certain language, we use certain concepts. And they mean something in a certain period of time, and mean something else in a different period of time. So the political situation, even though people sometimes tend to speak absolute universal truths, always has an impact as to how you contextualize those truths and ideas in a given context. So this context of the destruction of the temple in ancient, uh, and the conflict between ancient Judaism and Roman Empire was very much decisive for profiling Christianity in the first century AD. And of course some would say, well, that's actually uh, also the product of a later, later period when Christians actually 
uh, started collecting these documents and started codifying their belief in a more or less coherent system when we actually deal with Christianity as we know. So, as I said, it is a complicated question, there is no simple way of answering it, but it is important just to keep in mind these, <coughs> these complexities. Now, when it comes to the sources, uh, first of all, it says here primary sources. Do we know what primary sources are? What do we mean when we say primary sources for anything, not just Christianity? Depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, that doesn't. Depend. That actually has a technical meaning in, you know, in you scholarly. So you mean eyewitnesses? Could be eyewitnesses. So the testimony of the disciples would be primary sources? Yes, what else? Um, other eyewitnesses except <laughs> disciples. <laughs> Is there anything else? It's not just eyewitnesses. Maybe writings of someone. Mm -hmm. What would be, but, but to take, uh, to set aside a little bit uh, for, for a moment a Christian context, what would be primary source in general? Primary source for studying anything, you know? You want to study uh, the development of, uh, I don't know, uh, soccer games in Austria uh, over the last uh, 200 years. I don't know if that exists even, but... Uh, but uh, so, what would be the primary source? History writings, or scriptures of history, for mm -hmm. example. Um, um, of course, I mean, early it wasn't, but today, if you, if you, if you take the example for today, I would take any um, electro uh, electronic uh, uh, sources or maybe people. Well, but not every. So that's, that's a, we, we differentiate between primary sources. The primary source is something that gives you, let's put it that way, some kind of raw materials, raw information. Uh, and we call it primary as opposed to scholarly sources, sometimes called secondary, meaning if you want to study, let's say you want to study uh, the opinion of your parish, you know, what your parishioners think about, uh, I don't know, whatever you want, uh, the, the sky, the, the water, or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter, or, their, or, or you want to study their, what they think about, uh, I don't know, Mary, Magdalene. Uh, so, in that case, primary sources, if you want to study it from a historical perspective and say, okay, what they thought about this issue 200 years ago, would be all the documents that you can collect, just like somebody wrote a letter to somebody saying something about it. There was a conversation between people, just as we do now, and there is a record of that, a video, a document, doesn't matter. Uh, eyewitnesses, people who belong to those parishes, you can conduct an interview and ask them, okay, what do you mean, and they can fill out a questionnaire, that would be primary source. Scholarly sources would be scholarly studies of the phenomenon. So, uh, and in the case of, and that sometimes it's very important, and that will be important when you write your papers, uh, when you study, it is extremely important to differentiate between primary sources and secondary sources, not to confuse them because you expect different kind of information from the two. To treat secondary sources as primary, primary and secondary is, 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 is a problematic thing. Okay, sometimes in some areas it is sometimes difficult to differentiate between the two, but generally speaking, uh, we can say, especially when we talk about remote history, what primary sources are and what scholarly engagement with those sources. So we have two types, I mean we, have, we can divide it in many different ways, but we can divide it in two different types when it comes to early uh, primary sources for early Christianity. Primary non-Christian sources and Christian sources. In other words, what others were saying about Christians at that time and what Christians were saying about themselves and their faith. Do we know any uh, of the primary non-Christian sources for Christianity? Are they any? Yes. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. I mean, for example, if someone was studying um, at that time, the let's say, I don't know, the economic state 
of the Roman Empire or whatever, and he would um, write down those, I don't know, yeah, results or whatever, mm -hmm. that would be a primary non-Christian source, for example. Yes, but do we have... Historians, for example, historians who, would, who just would um, record any of historical event that happened at that time would also be a non-Christian primary source. But maybe. did they, did they do that? So the question is very practical. Do we have those documents? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a very important question. Yes? Yeah, we actually do. Like, uh, there are Gentile sources, mm -hmm. even Jewish sources. So, uh, like, uh, if you think of uh, Gentile sources, there's Tacitus that talks about the crucifixion of Christ, mm -hmm. the Christians themselves. Mm -hmm. There is, um, um, like, What's his name? Julius Africanus. And there is Josephus. Yeah, Josephus, the, the, the Jewish one, mm -hmm. who the Jewish philosopher, mm -hmm. historian, mm -hmm. who talked about um, Jesus, John the Baptist, James, the brother of mm -hmm. the Lord. Joseph, the father of Jesus, Africanus. Okay, it's like Africanus, yes. Uh, for example, mentions, um, the, the, mentions one Roman source that talks about the darkness, darkness which at um, the crucifixion of Christ, and mm -hmm. um, so there's also the Babylonian Talmud. Which yes, is, uh, but but that's a, that that's a, so we are talking about this a really early early period, and the earliest uh, uh, and of course there are many who then use some of the sources and repeat it. Then so most of them actually we know because some of them were uh, uh, preserved as such as original documents. Uh, of course, not original versions, but nevertheless original documents, complete texts, others just fragments. But we have, and that is uh, fortunate enough, because otherwise historians could accuse Christians of just making up the whole story uh, without uh, uh, documents. Of course, that is not something that's relevant for a believer, but for a historian, it is relevant because they would ask questions such as, okay, but uh, there is a story that Christians produced, but we are not first of all sure how far back does the story go. And if it's, not, if it's not confirmed in any other source, it's kind of lacks uh, reli reliability. So in this case, we have actually not very many of them, but we have some. Uh, and a remarkable one is from uh, the Antiquities of the Jews, or Jewish Antiquities, by Josephus. <coughs> As you can see, so uh, the first century source, where we find this uh, text that made many historians suspicious about it, because it seems so pro-Christian. Uh, where he talks about uh, there was time and this Jesus lived a wise man and indeed uh, one ought to call him a man for, for uh, he was one who performed surprising <laughs> deeds and was a teacher of such people and uh, da, 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 he was the Messiah. So some historians simply uh, dismiss this as, as a kind of Christian interpolation uh, in the text so that it, many historians were, were just skeptical about uh, this, that Josephus would actually use these words to describe, uh, to describe Christ and uh, the early Christians. Another letter that mentions Christians is a, literally a letter uh, Pliny the Younger uh, to Emperor Trajan and the letter was very kind of asked practical questions he basically asked uh, as a Roman administrator how to deal with Christians when it comes to trials so this is a clear document again from a very early period uh, that shows that Christians were established as a group uh, that Romans perceived them as a certain element, for most of the time disturbing element, and Pliny he is, here is addressing the emperor and then tells him, okay, I deal with them this way, so when they are brought to me, 
Uh, then I examined them and here I asked them whether they were Christians or not. If they confessed that they were Christians, I asked them again and a third time. Uh, and then if they preserved in their confession, I ordered them to be executed. And now his rationale is interesting for this. Uh, for I did not doubt, but let their confession be of any sort whatsoever, this positiveness and inflexible obstinacy deserve to be punished. There have been some of uh, this mad sect whom I took notice of in particular as Roman citizens that they might be sent to that city. That tells you something about the perception. Uh, this mad sect, uh, people who were perceived as uh, kind of, you know, perverted people for all sorts of reasons, accused of all sorts of, of things, uh, and we'll unpack that a little bit why. But he basically asked, him how, uh, asked the emperor how to deal with them, and the emperor actually replies him, and then it's again, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's preserved, and we have mentioned of Christians, and he basically approves of his strategy, uh, so how they should uh, deal with it, but this is just interesting as a point of uh, uh, historical curiosity, how Trajan, Emperor Trajan, uh, wanted to present himself, uh, saying, well, if they basically accuse them by sending letters without author, just spreading accusations, uh, that should, shouldn't have place in any kind of legal trial against that, for that would be a thing of very ill example and not agreeable with my brain. So in other words, he wants to present himself as a just emperor, uh, kind of establishing what we would call now, nowadays a uh, rule of law. So it must be, there must be a rule of law and you know, they cannot be just accused, invented something, but there must be people who will actually testify and, or if they themselves present themselves as Christians and they want, don't want to uh, offer sacrifices to Roman gods, meaning to renounce their Christianity, they deserve, they deserve to die. Then we have also uh, uh, Roman historians where we have mentioning of Christian, Christians and Christ. Uh, it is clear that these accounts were written based on the Roman perception of a, an established group that was troubling for them, but obviously had uh, it, it grew to a phenomenon in itself. And Tacitus here talks about, kind of goes uh, uh, through the basic historical uh, points of interest that kind of uh, conform more or less to the narrative that we have also from Christian sources when this whole story about Jesus uh, happened. And then he uh, basically says, if you uh, focus here, this uh, terrible superstition, how he calls Christian movement, uh, broke again out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty, then upon their information an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of uh, firing the city as of the hatred against mankind. He basically talks about, uh, of course, uh, the persecution of Christians uh, under Nero. Uh, but for us, it's, it's, it's interesting because it talks about early Christians as a, a superstition, uh, something shameful, something that just decent Roman citizens shouldn't have anything to do with. That's the basic mentality. And then he describes actually how uh, crucifixion, punishment of Christians um, happens. So again, in the context of Nero, Nero's rule, because as you might know, Nero, Emperor Nero, accused Christians uh, mm -hmm. of burning, burning Rome. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, that was the first actually massive uh, uh, extermination of Christians in Rome. And we have from Suetonius uh, another account on the punishment of Christians for their, again, superstition. These are the early accounts, non-Christian accounts, uh, that talk about Christianity, as you see from the earliest period. What are the primary Christian sources that we use and can use for learning about Christianity, uh, whether we are interested just in doctrinal issues or from a scholarly perspective? What are the categories of different sources that we find in the early Christian corpus. I think, first of all, the New Testament documents. The New Testament is there. The Apostolic Fathers. Apostolic Fathers. The Apologetics, whose mm -hmm. quote mm -hmm. and uh, sources mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. uh, Eusebius. Yeah. Who mentions inscriptions. Like History, yeah. 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 Anything else? Kitache? Yes, that belongs to this. Apostolic others. Well, let's start with uh, the New Testament text because you can also include these things that, and we'll talk about it uh, probably tomorrow apocrypha and agnostic texts. Because <coughs> No matter how narrow your definition of Christianity is, somewhere some of those texts that are not part of the official corpus of, of the canon of, of New Testament uh, need to be taken into account as sources for early Christianity. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, uh, which one of these texts uh, tells us the right version of Christianity and Christian faith. The thing is that the reading different texts, even those that are labeled as Gnostic or apocryphal, tells you a big deal about the landscape of early Christianity. And we learned over the course of 20th century much more than previous generations of theologians and scholars, simply because new texts were discovered that we uh, didn't know uh, that existed before, or we knew for some of them that they existed, but they were not available. But let's start with New Testament. How many books of the New Testament do we have? Uh, do we know all of them? Yes? Okay. So we have these kind of four main parts of the New Testament. Uh, the four Gospels and then uh, the Act, Acts of Apostles and uh, Epistles and then the Revelation. The question now is, how do we know that this is the New Testament? Who, who decided that this is the New Testament? The Jewish fathers, the early Jewish fathers, the Genesis. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that uh, prior to him there was no New Testament? And there was, but they because they um, there was in this oral um, uh, um, I think, uh, tradition tradition yes or religion mm -hmm. and so and they had the text so they could dis distinguish between between uh, the text which um, proved what the the oral um, sayings or tradition mm -hmm. and the other texts which were called later the apocrypha texts. Okay. Okay. So, as far as I know, uh, there are um, there is canons, canon oratory, and who, who uh, like contains I think twenty two books in mm -hmm. New Testament. One canon contains twenty four. I think there was much discussion about the canon itself. Like there were discussions uh, because of the pastoral mm -hmm. epistles, the epistle of James, epistle of epistles of John. Of, Jane, uh, of, of Jews, 
a, re a revelation, shall we say, a revelation of John, a revelation of Peter. Mm -hmm. Like, there was much like, discussion, I think, there was, like, they developed criteria, uh, like, um, the orthodoxy of the documents. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a... Um, yeah, there, there's correspondence. Correspondence uh, to, to the apostolic tradition. Mm -hmm. There's also the criteria of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. uh, is, it, is it Catholic? Like, is it accepted in the most of the churches? Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's also criteria of... Is it read in the liturgy? Read out in the liturgy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I think they developed many criteria. By the, by what they uh, like decided which books we should take, but that course took long, took like uh, um, well. There's a list. Sorry. How long did it take? Well, actually, uh, I think three hundred and sixty-seven mm -hmm. years until the first East mm -hmm. letter was mm -hmm. published by Saint Athanasius, Alexandria. Who I think wrote it first to his um, community in Alexandria, mm -hmm. but it actually took even longer, as far as I know, like until the fifth century in mm -hmm. Antioch, mm -hmm. the Bishita, the, the Aramaic canon. Mm -hmm. and I think there's much to say. Good, very good. So uh, when so that tells you. Uh, something also about uh, how this faith was was shaped during this this period, uh, and it's very interesting that, as you mentioned, those criteria that actually uh, we can talk loosely about some very criteria, but mostly for most of the time. Uh, like doctrinal issue is really a tricky one, it sounds as uh, catch-22, because on the one hand, if uh, you're supposed to learn the right doctrine from the scripture, how can you use the scripture to differentiate what's the right doctrine? So in a certain sense, it's a kind of, uh, you end up in a vicious cycle, uh, that uh, you either need to learn what's true faith from some other source and then see if that's true faith is, is present in the documents or you use the documents and learn from them but then how do you know that that's true faith so that's uh, that's why actually relying on uh, how often individual churches or churches that were in communion with each other used certain scripture providing this kind of reliability this is what churches uh, have been using up to our time. Therefore, the logic would be, well, this is more reliable than some of those that maybe some churches use, but not very many, which doesn't mean that that's not true. Or there is something uh, problematic about their exposition of faith in, the, in this scripture, but we are not sure about. So many of those we are not sure about uh, were left and became part of the Apocrypha, uh, which doesn't mean that they automatically uh, present false uh, doctrine or something that the Church uh, couldn't accept. It just means that uh, there was a decision, and as you said, that wasn't a decision of just uh, one council or one meeting, but it was actually a process of compiling, putting together, deciding what's going to be used in order to codify the text. That also tells you something about uh, essentially, essentially, I would say, uh, important in some respects, a difference between the approach to the Holy Scripture the different Christian traditions have. Uh, as you know, from a Protestant perspective, uh, doctrine, faith, is read from the scripture. It is believed that the scripture as such is the word of God, uncorrupted word of God, and you go there and you consult it, you read it, and then of course matter of interpretation is a different thing, but uh, uh, there is no uh, conception until you reach very modern period that actually there can be Christianity without the New Testament, without the scripture. From the Orthodox perspective, uh, it's different. Again, yeah, the scripture is important, it is the word of God, uh, it's uh, recorded in tradition, 
but it is clear, and it was clear from the very early period, that that, that cannot occupy the most important place. First of all, there were generations of Christians without canon of the New Testament. There were Christians who were perfectly, uh, if, if the apostles were not uh, right Christians, then the question is who was the right Christians? And the apostles lived their entire life without uh, New Testament, or you know, some of them wrote certain letters that would later uh, become canonical. So in a certain sense, there is a different approach to the letter uh, that the church at least when we talk about this mainstream Christianity over the first couple of centuries, perceived as uh, actually coming together, the common meal, the liturgy, and the event of Christ as something that is still at the center, uh, as opposed to uh, just having a new doctrine, something that's written on the paper that you read and recite, and that fixes all problems for, for you. The, uh, so th that is something that you can just think about also uh, in the future if you're interested in these particular theological questions. You know, what is that that actually constitutes uh, the orthodox, so to speak, approach to the Holy Scripture as opposed to some other approaches? And of course, uh, this is one answer to the question. Other answers can also be uh, given. Uh, do we know when these individual documents that eventually end up constituting the New Testament, when they were produced? How much time did it take for these texts that we have on the screen to be produced? I think the first one uh, was produced like the first at the mm -hmm. was it was the first epistle written, or first document, New Testament document. And I think it was 51 AD, 52. We're not sure, we cannot be that precise. But yeah. yeah. And I think it ended, uh, like the production ended in um, 96 or 100 with Revelation. Mm -hmm. So it was in the second half of the first century where it was. Yes. So most of them were produced in the second half in those 50 years. Uh, of the new era. Uh, we didn't discuss the issue, which is complicated enough, of when Jesus was born. So when we count uh, new era and old era, so but we don't need to discuss it. But in any case, it won't be really what we consider now uh, year one. Uh, but, uh, but following this calendar now, what's accepted, uh, new era, let's say from the 50s, 80, uh, these early documents uh, would be written and different authors of course propose different solutions as to those dates but sometime in the first uh, decade of the following 50 AD uh, these epistles were produced and then gradually we have the production of other texts so as you can see Paul was by far uh, the most prolific one and the earliest one. And then, of course, the Gospel of Mark uh, is considered to be the oldest among the four. Uh, and as you approach the end of the first century AD, uh, more of these documents are produced. Of course, John comes uh, at the very end of the first century and of course, we are not sure that uh, the author of both the Gospel and the Revelation, or the one who is attributed, uh, is necessarily the same person, but tradition has it that it is Apostle John, who uh, is uh, uh, the author of both the, act, uh, of both, uh, the Gospel and uh, the Revelation and uh, these epistles. And of course, when it comes to uh, trying to sort all of this out and come up with uh, a list of authoritative uh, books, we have Athanasius, who lists all of those that we now consider to be canonical, and other authors proposed different, uh, different lists. But they more or less already, that's uh, uh, clear, that already during the 2nd century, some were considered 
more authoritative than the other, who would constitute the canon or the New Testament. The thing is that just parallel to these, there were other texts, some of them uh, from the Apostolic Fathers, who were considered as equally relevant or authoritative at the same time. So then later would be come to this discrimination between them so that apostolic fathers or what we call in the modern period apostolic fathers uh, are considered somehow a little less authoritative than the New Testament but for many of those uh, church fathers, early uh, authors, uh, they would be used in regret in the churches together with, uh, with the New Testament texts. So that already tells you that the situation in this respect also was much more diverse and uh, uh, complex than it seems from a modern perspective when you have very clearly identified documents and uh, and easily proved. <coughs> Somebody uh, should tell me what time. Oh, uh, there is a clock here. Okay, so I don't know when did we start? 7 o'clock. 7? Yes, 7 p.m. 7, okay. So uh, the question is should we make a short break and then continue? You tell me depending on how you feel, because the general uh, plan was to have like uh, the whole session divided into two, first hour, second hour, so we can either continue and then have later a break or whatever you feel like. I think we could do, do a break now. Do a break. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, uh, 10 minutes, would that be yes. enough? Yes. 10 minutes, okay. Okay, uh, so we can proceed with the, uh, this collection called Apostolic Fathers. Uh, since I have a sense that many of these things are already known to you, let's try to go uh, briefly to make sure we cover all of them, but maybe there is no need to spend much time on discussing all the individual books and, and authors, if they are uh, if you're familiar with them. Uh, and we can spend some time, the rest of the time that we got uh, this evening, discussing uh, some things that, that actually go to the very heart of our thinking about early Christianity or Christianity uh, in general. So, what, what is this collection called Apostolic Fathers? First of all, why it's called that way, uh, what we find inside, and who decided that, that those different things should be presented as one big chunk of that sort of thing? The same was made of um, <coughs> teachers, fathers, or bishops who had a direct connection to apostles, like Saint Ignatius or Saint Polycarp, Smyrna, they were disciples of John. Or Saint Clement who was a disciple of Peter and Paul, so they had a, a direct connection. There was a discipleship between them. Um, we received the apostolic tradition mm -hmm. from the preachers. Right. So traditionally, these uh, different uh, documents that were composed, let's say, approximately hundred years or the course of the next hundred years since the beginning of Paul's epistles uh, were meant to be documents that are reliable because there was a belief that those who composed them were in direct contact with the apostles. So in a certain sense that the authority of the New Testament would come directly from the apostles or those who were uh, disciples of the apostles, as in the case of some gospel writers, and in this case those who were in touch with the apostles uh, were the persons uh, whose documents were considered authoritative enough. Of course, uh, scholars would nowadays doubt uh, really uh, some of the previous dating of these uh, or the authorship of some of the some of the books. Uh, the clear case there is the so-called Second Clement, that uh, is a very different document from the First Clement, uh, and uh, there are also doubts 
as to the authorship compared to the tradition. But nevertheless, uh, their authority was very well established in the early church. And uh, uh, some of them, as we previously said, were used together with uh, uh, the documents, some of the documents that ended up in the New Testament canon as authoritative enough as something that is considered or was considered of the same value. Uh, what we find in these documents is really uh, not one single uh, topic that's elaborated, but rather a range of different uh, topics that mostly deal with the issue of uh, ethical issues, issues of uh, uh, discipline, church organization, and also some doctrinal issues that tell us a lot how the early Christian, uh, early Christian certainly followers of Jesus were contextualizing in this period at the beginning, the end of the first century, AD, the beginning of the second century, their faith. So what we, for example, find in Clement is first Clement, a document that Church of Rome, exemplified by this uh, bishop who was uh, there at the very end of the, the first century AD, uh, addresses Corinthians and then presents uh, all sorts of uh, instructions uh, that have to do with church organizations and articulation of faith. Uh, in the second plan, for instance, we really find uh, homily, and probably the reason why the confusion uh, started with first Clement is that the document uh, probably was attached to the first Clement without any organic uh, uh, connection with it. Uh, one of the most authoritative sources in this early period that continue to be used is this one, Didache. What, what is this document? It's somewhat specific compared to the rest that we find in this collection. It's, it um, includes some of the basics of, of Christianity. And sometimes you even find like um, some sayings of Jesus that you, if you have read the Bible before you know that it's, it's um, a verse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is there uh, one prayer, Eucharistic prayer, that you don't find anywhere else. So that is why it's believed that it might be based either on an earlier document or that this document itself is that earlier document that kind of predates uh, the Gospels. And that is, uh, there is now a lot of literature just uh, just about, yeah, sure. uh, uh, just, uh, just about actually this, this very topic and uh, uh, the prayer and the differences there compared to uh, the, the rest of the Eucharistic prayers. Uh, we, of course, find a whole range, and I want to bother you now with going uh, in detail through these authors, so you can, of course, read them, uh, <clears throat> who, at the same time, some of them were mentioned, Polycarp or Smyrna. Uh, who tried to already then confront some of the teachings, uh, different teachings that started to occur within the early church. And this is another important big topic that we should spend some time discussing, and that is the issue of the correct or right doctrine. Uh, we see from virtually the earliest period, already recorded in the New Testament and then in these documents, Apostolic Fathers, that there were, uh, from the very beginning, various uh, issues among uh, Christians uh, where different groups would understand various aspects of faith differently. The question that immediately occurred is how do you differentiate between what is the correct interpretation of faith 
and what is not. Uh, already in uh, these writings, we find uh, examples of, among some of them, apologetic literature. And apologetic literature, as you know, basically means uh, an attempt of one party within this Christian movement or other Christian movements to defend their understanding of faith from the perspective of the mainstream church tradition that is usually interpreted as uh, those authors and church fathers who are defending true faith against various heresies. Another thing that we find there, which is uh, very important, is that some of these texts are clearly now anti-Jewish. And this speaks to, to the story that we elaborated a little upon earlier, uh, the new change situation in which Christianity found itself uh, over the course of those decades following Jesus' death and uh, then later centuries. Uh, it is clear now that there was a need to define themselves in opposition to Judaism and to uh, even accuse Judaism of basically uh, uh, corrupting uh, the original Jewishness of this long tradition. And of course, just as in this uh, case, uh, the concept now occurs pretty clearly that chosen people uh, of God are the Christians, something that is also called uh, New Israel. Uh, the old Israel uh, was meant to be uh, descendants of one patriarch, so basically one nation that shares uh, blood ties among themselves members of a tribe, we would say, uh, with, in touch with God, uh, personally confirming this connection with God, but nevertheless belonging to one nation. Uh, the concept now that would be advanced here is that Christians are new Israel in a different sense of the word. What is that sense of the word? We find also in this famous document, uh, the Epistle to Diognetus, where Christian condition in the world is basically interpreted as the one of constantly wandering uh, in the world and not belonging to the world. So you probably know these are, these are the, from, from chapter 5 and 6, uh, the, the famous uh, lines from, from this epistle that talks about Christians as people who are not uh, different from other people in any visible, perceptible way. So they uh, do not have their specific country, their specific language, uh, their specific customs, so they share that with uh, the rest of the people. There is no peculiar form of speech and nor uh, life and all of that. Uh, but they dwell in their own countries, but simply as soldiers. As citizens, they share no things with others and yet endure all things as a foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Of course, there are other translations, one of them says, uh, but they are living in heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned to death and restored to life. They are poor yet make many rich. Uh, they are in lack of all things and yet uh, abundant in all. Uh, to sum up, all in one word, what the soul is in the body, that are Christians in the world, the soul is dispersed to all the members of the body and it's all that. So they are, the final line, in the, well in the world, but they are not of the world. So this classical uh, expression, uh, as you can see, has all sorts of implications, both political, social, and strictly speaking, doctrinal. Because from this you can derive uh, 
a basic uh, ecclesiology. What do I mean by that? This understanding that new Israel, new people of God, is now not members of a certain nation, a certain collective. It's not negated. That's also interesting. So it doesn't say you cease to be who you are, Greek or Jew or whoever else. But you are not identified with it. You as Christian need to grow out of that. You need to become a citizen of the kingdom of God. Uh, that means it has direct implications as to how early Christians, at least some of them, conceptualized the church. The church not as something, an institution, uh, the way the church very often nowadays uh, is, uh, you know, very often functions as either a national club or an institution that uh, is supposed to preserve uh, national tradition and national languages and stuff like that. But the church as a group of those people who actually refuse to identify themselves with anything that belongs to this world, who establish their identity in the kingdom of God. So that shows, and at the same time it shows the tension, and that has implications toward what's called political theology, how Christians conceptualize their functioning within concrete societies uh, and socio-political organizations. And this is one expression of that political theology, saying we are not there to establish our separate institutions, in other words, our separate societies, our separate states that will be Christian. We share it with the rest of the world, but we refuse to be reduced to them, to be obedient to them completely. So we choose the kingdom of God. Uh, what is clear is that if you look at some other documents, from previous period, from this period, or from later period, is that you'll find different answers to this question. So not all early Christian authors, or for that matter, any Christian authors, uh, in any period uh, were in uh, Concord when it comes to this issue. We can pick this issue, we can pick many other issues as well. Uh, when it comes, for example, to the, uh, to the question uh, how should Christians behave vis-a-vis -vis the sphere of politics? You find a range of different answers. And there wasn't uniformity among them, and there still is no uniformity uh, among them. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm stressing this because it is, I think, important to, to uh, get the idea that uh, what very often is obscured in uh, ecclesial discourse and also in some theologies. Uh, very often Christian tradition is presented as one unified, coherent narrative where everyone basically agrees with everyone else and, and it just, you know, is kind of a little bit elaborated in some later, uh, at some later stage, but everything is fundamentally the same and all people agree, and especially all saints agree, and especially all church fathers agree. Well, that just doesn't correspond to reality. Uh, what we see when we look at documents, there is a lot of disagreements. There is a lot of disagreements on things that you would call not so important. Uh, like, if you reduce this question to the question, how do you live as a Christian in a given society? Well, it's clear, it's not a doctrinal issue. And there are disagreements there, but there are disagreements also when it comes to the trans issues. Uh, and I think that is important because uh, in spite of those disagreements, uh, we can still consider these different authors, saints, and parts of one tradition. So we can, of course, think about it and uh, develop, it, uh, develop it more. Uh, but uh, the question that I would like you to think is what constitutes that one tradition to which all these different perspectives belong. Uh, if we want to reduce it to just a certain number of texts, whether it be New Testament, whether it be Apostolic Fathers, whether it be concrete uh, church uh, fathers, certain theologians, would that be the right approach? Would we find there in this corpus of texts orthodox? Will you find their true tradition, true 
lecture is finished. That is something to think about. If you have any uh, questions or comments, please <coughs> share with us. Uh, and of course, we uh, will conclude uh, this uh, list of uh, the Apostolic Fathers and the texts that, as I said, address pretty much a, a variety of questions, all of them relevant for those early communities, not necessarily for the church as a whole being present in different cities, but very often addressing concrete issues uh, in particular locations and trying to deal with uh, concrete issues from the perspective of the Christian faith or uh, the way these authors articulated uh, Christian faith. Uh, what I just mentioned in regard to uh, these uh, uh, episode fathers and documents there becomes very relevant when we come to the issue of apocrypha and so-called Gnostic texts. Uh, what do we know about these so-called Gnostic texts and the Apocrypha? Um, as far as uh, Apocrypha means hidden or non-revealed, and it's like it should mean that um, there is knowledge that no one knows of. Which only the Gnostics know, of, and by which you can be saved. Like uh, Gnosis means uh, knowledge, mm -hmm. by knowledge you can be freed from. Like to have a idealistic view of the world, um, like um, uh, everything that is material is evil, and everything that is uh, spiritual, the spiritual realm, realm um, is good. And they uh, created like two and um, gave it different differences, contradictions, like uh, yeah, contradicting uh, images of God, yeah. like one God who is the God of the Old Testament, who created man and created all material things, and like put all men into slavery by like, putting them into bodies, which are made by material. And um, Christ came, who is the God of the New Testament, who is the good God, who frees men from, uh, from the slavery of the body mm -hmm. by knowledge, by Moses. Mm -hmm. And the Apocrypha should um, like testify to the work Christ has made. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there are like, many Gnostic Gospels, Epistles, mm -hmm. Acts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of um, Nicodemus, and the, epistle, the third epistle of Corinthians, mm -hmm. Acts of John, like all those things um, testify. Mm -hmm. So, is it. Uh, so, you, you describe nicely both the, the concept of the Apocrypha and Gnostic uh, Gnosticism, so it has to do with the Gnosis. With the, knowledge. Are these two concepts necessarily related one to another? Is everything that we consider apocryphal texts necessarily Gnostic and vice versa? What was the question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But I think most of them made like by agnostic groups mm -hmm. um, but they might be made by like uh, I think uh, followers. followers of adoptionism mm -hmm. who believe Christ became the son of God at 30 mm -hmm. I think there was there was a document they could produce mm -hmm. um, there might also be Christian uh, gospels uh, gospels but documents were not accepted, who were not mm -hmm. accepted, mm -hmm. but like, I think they do not uh, contain any heretical uh, stuff, mm -hmm. as far as you know. Mm -hmm. 
So these are not really equivalent uh, concepts in the sense that, as we said, many things that are considered apocryphal, it just can mean simply uh, it didn't make its way into the canon of mm -hmm. the New Testament. It's not something that was widely used, but in principle, nothing needs to be terribly wrong with it. Okay, from the mainstream perspective, that's fine. So in other words, you would read it, you know, no, no harm there. Uh, on the other hand, what was labeled uh, Gnostic was perceived by these Christian authors as something that significantly uh, diverges Christian faith into a different direction, which is very different from, from those reliable texts and uh, the tradition that the Church tried to keep. However, there are problems with these concepts. First of all, uh, Gnosticism and Gnostic texts is something that those are concepts that some of the uh, early apologetics uh, early fathers used and reacted against, as we saw in the old mention some of them. Uh, so we know that they already then perceived certain groups and certain teachings as uh, problematic and heretical because they were Gnostic. Which of course doesn't mean that all heretical teachings, what was labeled as heretical, was Gnostic. And it also doesn't mean that everything that later would become known as a Gnostic text actually conforms to those individual teachings. The problem with the, with the label Gnostic is that it became, in the Christian tradition, so broad that almost anything, I mean, it was used in such a way that everything that's not uh, the mainstream or separate thing is Gnostic. But it's not. Uh, Gnosticism, the way if you select certain texts and that uh, deal with a certain kind of nonsense, certain kind of knowledge, uh, then that group and those texts becomes something much, much, much smaller. Uh, and there are other teachings that are not, some of them are dualistic, others are non dualistic. Uh, others present other different narratives that have nothing to do with some kind of hidden secret knowledge. Uh, the way Gnosticism was interpreted is that in its core as a doctrine where you need to be initiated into some kind of hidden secret knowledge in order to become a member of the group, of that church or that community. Okay. That of course leads us immediately to the question, what's the church? But we'll come to that a little later. So, uh, and by that knowledge, that becomes now complicated. Because in a certain sense, Christians, all Christians, including mainstream Christians, Orthodox Christians, uh, they are Gnostics. Now, yeah, well, what kind of heresy is this, uh, <laughs> is this professor spreading? Uh, they are Gnostics. In what sense? There's a, a Bible verse in uh, John 17 that said, um, where Jesus said or prayed, uh, This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only one God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Like that knowledge of God and his Christ, or the Father and the Son, that's the knowledge of the Holy Trinity that we seek. Yes, and there is also, you should uh, recognize, you should get to know truth, and truth will set you free. Uh, so there are multiple, I mean, as soon as you start uh, reading John, it's very, in that sense, philosophical. Uh, talking about knowledge, talking about uh, all sorts of things that sound extremely similar to some other, other doctrines. Uh, so the problem with the term uh, Gnostics and Gnosticism is that it is so, so imprecise because it doesn't really tell us what kind of knowledge or what is uh, what is problem with certain knowledge uh, because it's clear that knowledge in itself cannot be a problem. Uh, that Christians in a certain sense get to know something that others don't. 
there is the Old Testament tradition, a very long Old Testament tradition, which goes back to the temple and temple theology, which tells that those who actually were uh, priests or were anointed as priests were getting certain knowledge. And this is what we are, where the whole confusion then uh, comes from. Uh, what do we mean by that knowledge? What kind of knowledge are we obtaining? Is it rational knowledge? Is it some kind of specific information? Just as in some secret cult, in, I don't know, secret societies, in Freemasons or something where you progress and you get certain knowledge, or is it something else? So these are the things that just using label of Gnostics uh, uh, just doesn't help. It, it confuses things. So there were those teachings that were dualistic, but they may not necessarily uh, ask for certain kind of knowledge in terms of uh, something that you need to go through a process of initiation to get to know that. There are those who are not dualistic but had certain initiation process where you get to know something that others don't. That's why I talked about uh, those mystery cults. In mystery cults, generally, the idea was that you go through a process of initiation and then once you are inside, and there may be in internally layers to the membership of the, of the club, you get to know something that other people don't know. And then internally, when you progress and you get to a higher stage, you know the truth even more fully than the other members. And then when you get to the very top, you kind of know it, know it all. Uh, but that, that's typical of, of most of, the, of those uh, mystery cults that I listed and many others that, that, that existed. Uh, Christianity, even the mainstream Christianity, has elements of this. Think in terms, if you are making parallel to, to the cults, Christianity started as an exclusive uh, club. In what sense? Uh, not exclusive uh, based on, you know, uh, who you are, are you born in this family, that family, are you that, no, no, no. But the club that you, be, you get uh, to the table to share a meal through the process of initiation called baptism. So, uh, baptism and baptism is, its basic structure is also something that we find in pre-Christian times uh, as a purification ritual. So you become a member of a certain group that then does something that is not shared with others. Uh, liturgies preserve that call for those who are not baptized to leave, get baptized, uh, to leave the church before actually uh, the canon of the Eucharist and and actually getting to share that meal, if you will, that mystery. Uh, and we call it mystery as well. But not a mystery that, of course, uh, requires some kind of special rational knowledge to know. It's a different kind of mystery. It's a different kind of knowledge. It's not so much about what you know, but how you get to see things, and so on and so forth. So the general uh, concept of Gnosticism obscured this and only basically in the modern period when we got some of those documents that previous Christian authors discussed but we didn't have them, we saw actually that the complexity there uh, is much, much bigger than we, we uh, thought. So this is uh, one, you know, the list is, 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 is much longer, some of those uh, texts, and they, as I said, range from uh, modifying the stories or offering parallel narratives to what we find in canonical uh, Gospels and the texts that Christians accepted as uh, uh, truthful, to those that offer counter-narratives, uh, where, uh, for example, just as what we, what we uh, heard, but, but there are even crazy examples where uh, the whole story about the beginning of, of the creation of the world is presented uh, turned upside down, where you know, those texts say, like, what kind of God is that who creates the world and then puts uh, 
uh, first human beings there and then kind of uh, tells them don't do that and they do that and then he changes his mind and then takes them out and that, that God is just like it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense so and there then interpretation is no 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 but actually the wisdom that God got there that prompts salvation to to the first human beings is uh, is true true through the serpent uh, so where you have the serpent from the uh, Genesis story as prefiguration of Christ so you have all sorts, and you have also uh, texts that just uh, don't address these issues present like their own mostly philosophical tradition and so on and so forth. So uh, just saying that to illustrate that the actual landscape of positions and texts that were in place was extremely complicated one. So it was not in the first centuries of Christianity and the Church, and that is what we are discussing these days, it was not so much about one clarified and clear church Christian tradition and then deviations from that tradition as much it was about having a plurality of different interpretation approaches and then slowly out of that multiplicity uh, constitution of what we would know as mainstream or orthodox tradition. So selecting slowly, slowly, slowly over the course of a couple of centuries among those different things on various criteria that we already discussed about. And so the uh, final uh, group among those primary Christian sources that we are talking about are the early uh, church fathers. Of course, some of those texts that we already uh, named uh, kind of uh, uh, provide the basis for those uh, individual authors that would formulate their own uh, theologies in the later period, starting already with the second century. Uh, and among them, we can differentiate uh, among those apologists, those who more specifically focus on arguing against specific teachings, some of those teachings being also Gnostic teachings, but many others. Uh, the thing is that for most of the time, in the first uh, couple of centuries, you can almost all what we call church fathers were also apologists, this period of the uh, The reason for that, of course, can be found in a simple fact that so many of different teachings uh, to which uh, uh, they had to respond some of them felt also threatened, needed uh, to, to uh, articulate uh, these uh, orthodox positions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, individual uh, other interpretations. But they shared this up until very late in the history of the Roman Empire, when the empire would become officially Christianized and when proliferation of these different uh, cults and teachings would be much more restricted. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the very concept comes from the defense of one's opinion, and it started, as we already saw, with the Roman Empire and accusations that Romans advanced against Christians, but then it continued and became more complex because the time changed. So slowly uh, the time of the Apostles and Christ was becoming uh, more and more distant from them. There was a need to respond to the changing uh, social and political climate, such as also persecutions. Uh, there was a need, as we said, to respond to Judaism, and all of this uh, made them formulate their apologetic theologies. Some of them in a more balanced and, let's say, neutral way, others much more passionately and much more directly. Some of those, uh, to go back to the uh, typically Roman, accusations, and, and those accusations uh, do not just belong to the first century or the second century, but actually continued, uh, where we saw then 
So just here uh, uh, a summary that those are uh, people with no piety, they are atheists, they practice incense, the, uh, incest, they practice cannibalism, so, and the list continues. Uh, okay, some of those accusations were of course just a way of othering Christians, of saying, well, they do unspeakable things that these human beings don't do and therefore you should despise them and therefore it's also right to kill them, sentence them, kill them and kind of neutralize that evil from our society. Let us not forget, however, that almost the same accusations that Christians experienced when they were a minority within the Roman Empire, the mainstream Christians would advance against specific target groups when they became majority. As soon as they became majority in the 4th century, as soon as in the 4th century Christianity became the official uh, uh, religion of the Roman Empire, you would have the language against well, those who were labeled as heretics or against entire social groups, ethnic groups, uh, uh, gender groups, and so on, that would use almost the same language. Uh, later on, when we come to dealing with witches, uh, the language that, that would be used is uh, even the same or even worse than the Romans used, which tells you something about uh, the mechanism of othering certain people for the purposes of eliminating them from the society or at least then threatening them and marginalizing them. Nobody is uh, uh, immune to this. So, officially Christian or not Christian, that doesn't matter uh, if uh, you turn Christianity into an ideology and then you try to use the right doctrinal one way of doing things against other groups. So, Christians experienced that, that but when next generations of Christians became dominant, when they took the instruments of power, the whole empire, um, most of them behaved the same way as the Roman Empire behaved. Christians. Uh, but interesting thing here that I would like to uh, spend some time on uh, before we finish is this accusation uh, for atheism. Okay, if it's easy to say, okay, incestuous relation, that's the blah blah blah, you know, nonsense and cannibalism, okay, you could kind of see the logic if they believe that, uh, uh, that their savior is at the same time God and human being and that they ate blood and, and body of their savior, so you can see the logic of why someone could assume, okay, they are actually eating human flesh and, and, and body, so okay, fine, there's some logic to that, but like, why atheism? Because, for example, from the Roman Empire perspective, they, they would worship many idols, many gods, and the Christians said, no, you are wrong, we only have this only one god. And for, from the Roman Empire um, perspective, the Christian were the, <laughs> the first atheists in the history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's a curious thing because we said that Romans didn't have a really problem with uh, uh, different groups worshipping their own gods. Yes, so, but the problem was that if someone became Christian, for, for example, in Roman, in Roman Empire history, well, they had um, like different ceremonies before they started, started doing anything. For example, if there was a, a feast, they would um, worship their idols before they start the feast or the wedding or whatever. And the Christians wouldn't attend those rituals and so they would separate themselves from the, from the society. The Roman Empire didn't want that, so they thought, because they're atheists, because they don't believe our gods, they're making a distinguish between... Uh, and the crucial thing there is not that they just don't believe our gods, uh, but that they don't actually participate in yes. this socio-political and religious mm -hmm. whole. They are distancing themselves from the state, from the rest of the citizens. Uh, because Romans couldn't care less uh, if you believe this God, God or the other God. They just, you know, okay. You, if you believe that uh, Zeus was uh, the only God, fine. If you believe that mm -hmm. Zeus had five children or one child or no children, they, they, it, it was fine. Mm -hmm. So they, they actually, at that level, uh, they allowed a lot of they, uh, that religion, we call it religion, but in 
a separate discussion from that, that concept uh, alone. But in their perception, uh, there was no doctrine. There was no certain set of beliefs that you had to profess in order to belong to this religion. No. Uh, that's why they, curiously enough, and that's what we will continue discussing uh, tomorrow, uh, you don't have heresies in ancient Rome or ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Why they didn't have heresies? And Christians, as soon as they started their movement, they had heresies. So, like, uh, they, they couldn't even manage to write their New Testament. There are some full heresies and different teachings, and it continued. And it continues all the way. So, for 2,000 years, the biggest business, when you look at it from that perspective of Christians, is production of heresies, various teachings. Uh, and they were condemning each other, and her heretics, and exclude, and da 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 da, kill, burn, whatever you want, all that uh, uh, lovely history. Uh, but ancient uh, Romans, uh, just like uh, I believe, a little bit different. I don't believe that that God is really a God. Well, okay, fine. You know, uh, or I believe a different God. I believe in Egyptian gods. Well, okay, no problem. I believe in Greek gods. Fine. In a, you know, whatever you believe. But as we said, there was a limit to that. The limit was uh, whether that religion can be embraced within the socio-political. And Christianity there, Judaism first, but then they found a way to kind of, okay, we cannot just exterminate all of them and just to, to complicate it. So let's give them a, a certain autonomy and keep them, you know, they are under supervision. But then Christians came with an even uh, more radical and crazier message uh, from their perspective. They said, not only that those gods that you worship are not real gods. Uh, they said, okay, well, whatever. Uh, but but there is only one God, and to add to that, and that was just reaching the limits of, of Roman tolerance, and then going over that, that God is our King. Uh, that is death sentence, uh, the end of Roman tolerance. Uh, that means the way the Romans would hear that message is. Uh, you refuse to accept the rule of the emperor in Rome. In other words, you <coughs> refuse to accept the state. You are subversive elements. You are those who are troubling the state. Therefore, as you saw in those Roman narratives, it is legitimate to uh, get rid of them because they are endangering our society. Uh, and I'll finish with that. Think about how the same logic very often is it work in what officially is presented as Christianity. When we talk about Christian states, when we talk about Christian politics, when we talk about instruments of power and call them Christians, uh, how those Christians who introduce Christianity that way, uh, would they be tolerant to the same message? And very often you find in many of those political theologies a uh, similar mindset. The idea that somehow uh, the power, political power and state, is something that has uh, supremacy over living a Christian life. And very often in Christian history, Christian theologies, we actually see how this typically Roman mentality was just then adopted and officially became Christian, but state Roman. That if you question the state, uh, that's that's something where that, that we cannot tolerate. So that speaks to a different topic that, of course, we won't uh, discuss here, and that is uh, what is this ideal or best model of socio political organization from a Christian point of view. So we saw in some of these uh, early Christian writings, uh, the, the Apostolic Fathers, there were some answers offered to that question. Uh, we saw that John, for example, in the Revelation, offers a very different kind of answer to the same question, rejecting the power of Rome. There were others who were much more uh, open toward making a deal with the Roman state. So this would be from the very early Christian period, uh, something that Christians continue to actually exercise and practice uh, all the time up to this moment.
So if you have any questions or comments uh, at the end.